right, I'm just quickly going to introduce our panelists, and I'm on the wrong page. No, that's the right page. Um, so Liz Lash, who is working on her getting her slides ready, um, is, associate, is an associate professor at William and Mary uh, in American Studies, where she focuses uh, focus on new media ecologies um, and works a lot with selfies and hashtag activisms, activism. Sora Han uh, here is um, an associate professor at UCI, or uh, yeah, at UCI, um, working on criminology, law, and society, and a lot of her focus is on critical race theory. Lucas is um, the head, of, uh, is the chief scientist at Jigsaw, where they work with online protections and rights. All right, and with that, I will open it for the first one who wants to introduce their work a bit more. Yeah, yeah. I can get rid of the slides, yeah. that way. <laughs> um, so I'm Liz Lash, and part of uh, why I'm here is uh, to talk about digital rhetoric, which is one of the hard problems. So how do we consider questions of rhetorical context when we're thinking about how discourse functions in online communities? Um, I've been thinking about this partly in the context of new experiments in scale and access in higher education as we think about online environment and the pres online environments and the presence of possible bad actors um, in different kinds of learning situations, um, particularly as we think about uh, some of these large scale experiments in bringing uh, higher education to newer communities. Um, I'm part of FemtechNet um, and have been a former co-facilitator of the collective. Um, and FemtechNet is interested in thinking about how technology uh, represents uh, rhetorical context that might involve tacit knowledge practices, that might promote particular values, that might be grounded in material context and materiality, that might represent particular kinds of affective and embodied engagements that might involve certain labor practices that might be complex um, and that is often highly situated rather than represents a kind of universal condition or a condition of neutral engagement. Um, so I think we can think about things like uh, the Cracker, cracker Barrel Gate uh, situation that this woman who posted this um, uh, posting on Twitter um, and documented all of the online abuse that she received from racist trolls afterwards, including some very specific threats to herself and her family. Um, and the ways that Twitter treated the case very differently from Facebook. And I think one of the complex questions that we have to face is not just, uh, so rhetoric is a practice of analysis, but it's also a practice, a pedagogical practice. And I thought Carol's uh, talk where she was talking about ways that we can model behavior is also important. So how do we think about natural language processing not only as an analytical tool but as a potentially pedagogical tool I think is an important one. But in this case when she posted evidence of her online abuse um, she was treated as someone who was violating a user agreement by reposting content from other users. And so Twitter was supportive of her uh, resistance to this online abuse, while Facebook actually treated her as the bad actor in the situation. So I think we have some, some complicated situations that um, I'm glad that Jackie Wernemann is going to be talking about more in connection to the Center for Solutions to Online Violence. But there are also other groups that are trying to do uh, user-centered design projects. Um, I know one of the things we're going to talk about is how different communities exist online and different types of online violence. And I point to the work of Moya Bailey here. And also uh, think about how it's very important not to use user as a universal category. Uh, often in human rights discourses, we, we sort of think about the universal human, um, but that's something that can be very problematic. This is something that Seta Gersis has talked about a lot. I really like the way that she talks, uh, when Carol was talking about free apps and the this, this, this sort of entire media ecology that people participate in and the ways that they can be participating in unhealthy 
uh, privacy practices that shouldn't be treated as a moral um, judgment about the person, but rather how do we think about these more kind of complicated situations of scarcity and resource management. Um, and so, I mean, I think that uh, if we're thinking about uh, kairos or rhetorical occasion, um, how do we think about the balance between these rapidly changing modes of interaction? So the word kairos, which is a big word in rhetoric, means exact time, season, or opportunity, but it also means do measure proportion or fitness. So how do people participate in real time in these online communities where, as many of our paper presenters have noted, the situations change rapidly? And how can we adapt for these very kind of complex situations? These are hard, hard questions. Um, and so I think uh, I'd kind of leave it in that, that situation which, when we're talking about intimacy in public space, these are difficult questions to adjudicate and figuring out how to keep the processes transparent, particularly when we're talking about uh, introducing things like machine learning, uh, I think can be really important. Um, so as we're deciding who gets included and who gets excluded from online communication, particularly when people who one group would identify as cyber bullies will actually try to claim that they're activists. Um, I think we have a very difficult situation. I've been looking a lot at how these men's rights activists actually appropriate feminist discourse and try to use the language of being an oppressed group um, as a way to justify cyberbullying. So anyway, I will turn this over to Soren. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I, I want to say that I am totally sort of outside of this field of study and research. Um, I'm a legal scholar, so I know a lot about the sort of history of anti-discrimination law. And, um, and the, the question that was given to us, what is the most important or pressing issue about abusive language online, was sort of like maybe the easiest question that I was ever given, because I was like, Duh, it's the president that's the problem. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, I, you know, I learned so much sort of trying to research enough so that I could participate in this conversation. Um, the technology is sort of beyond, I mean, I don't even participate in Twitter. Um, but, I, you know, the, the most sort of resonant analog in the legal context, specifically around this problem of abusive language, is the sort of um, issue of hate speech that was very central to the culture wars during the 1980s and 1990s. And I want to argue um, today that, you know, we sort of think about us being in the midst of, like, the culture wars too, right? Um, we recently saw press, you know, sort of coverage on um, Jeff Sessions, you know, sort of, you know, sort of um, taking on you know, the issue of affirmative action in, in colleges in the U.S. and that kind of thing. So um, we, are, we are in that miss, and it's in where I want to say that what we see is this sort of rampant hate mongering online and sort of the afterlife of what was um, lost in the culture wars, which was specifically a kind of definition and battle in the sort of terrain of free speech to specifically identify hate speech as prohibited speech, as speech that could not be claimed or protected by the First Amendment, okay? Um, and I'm not gonna try through that entire jurisprudence, and I'm speaking on a very sort of high lofty level of constitutional <coughs> law. Um, but I do think that what what is relevant, relevant about constitutional law, and relevant even if what those of us in this room might bemoan as sort of bad decisions, um, lost cases, okay? Even if we've lost those cases, the sort of principle, the issues about how we imagine what free speech is in a democratic society that is continually sort of revealing itself to be structured by um, sort of 
um, unmovable inequalities, okay? Um, that, that is something that I think, not tech, sort of industry in general can sort of take on because of course the private sector and government historically have partnered to suppress free speech, okay? But I do think that at, in, in a gathering like this, we can really start, start to sort of take up the challenge of um, articulating what it means to be professionals working in this industry and what kind of ethics it, it, um, this kind of profession sort of wants to embody and put forward. Okay, so I'm thinking about the kind of ethics, professional ethics of a lawyer, professional ethics of a doctor, professional ethics of those working in these industries. What would that look like and how would it embody something like a progressive civil libertarianism? Okay, in contrast to the libertarianism that is the the dominant discourse, right? Right to bear arms, states' rights, right to defend property um, with no limits. Though that's the, that's the libertarianism, that's the discourse of libertarianism today. The question is, how do we imagine what a progressive civil libertarianism is today in this moment, given the expertise in this room um, around the, the nature of speech and public discourse that these technologies enable, right? Which is something that I can't answer as a legal. I'm interested in hearing those answers from you all. Um, but from a legal standpoint, from a standpoint in the law where um, the law is not neutral, the law has never been neutral, the law is responsible for promulgating certain broad principles, that even if not universal, should be universal, okay? Um, it's, it's absolutely urgent today to have those conversations. Um, and I actually went online yesterday to sort of see what Jigsaw was doing with the New York Times, and I, I, mean, it, I mean, in that way, I learned something completely new, and it's fascinating, but that is precisely um, that kind of um, partnership is where these conversations around not just abusive language, but specifically hate speech, speech that is motivated by intent to assert an inherent inferiority of minority groups, okay? How that is a specific ethical issue that these partnerships between science and media or researchers and educators and, and the tech industry are going to confront explicitly, right? Because that was something that was dropped in the culture wars of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so I think that's five minutes. Okay. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, so maybe I should. Um I'll say something about the thing with New York Times in case others are, are, aren't aware of it. But I'll start off a little bit with um, uh, what motivates me and uh, the group in Jigsaw. Um, it started off uh, at, at some way in uh, Myanmar, curiously, where we, we were there and we were noticing uh, a lot of online campaigns that were tackling the Rohingya people, and in particularly were, were uh, attempting to shame them. And so we noticed this online phenomena of, of uh, it was unclear whether it was state-sponsored or vigilante exactly, um, but of, of uh, a, mass, a mass racism uh, acted out online in, on Facebook and other platforms. Um, more generally, we're wondering, well, then, how do we have um, good conversations at scale? What can we, the other motivation for me was coming uh, into this from uh, a series of bad decisions and wondering like why did they happen? How could I have been involved in them? Noticing how hard it was to find uh, you know, a place that we'd all agree to to go to a conference dinner. Even with 10 people it's hard to make a decision. How do we, how do, we do this at a much bigger scale? How do we tackle climate change? And then how do we tackle the, the deep problems that we've heard of that affect people's lives very dramatically and very directly? So the internet was supposed to be the solution, right? Uh, that's what I thought when I was a teenager, that you know, we're breaking down the barriers of space and time. We could talk to people, we could, you, thousands of people could read what we wrote, 
um, but it fell quite far short. Um, so the problem of having good discussions is certainly not new. The internet was quite new. Um, and, and then the question is like in some sense in my mind, what's new now? And that's a little bit where, uh, where my interest was renewed here. Um, a bunch of the machine learning and the computer's ability to understand language, if that is pushes through some sort of threshold in its level of understanding, if we can identify hate speech, if we can identify you know, passive aggression, implied negative intent, then that opens up a whole possibility of new things we can do, both on an educational level for how can people learn to be more empathetic, compassionate, uh, how can we help people um, you know, when they're receiving uh, abuse, as well as you know, help people realize you know, what they're doing. It's absolutely inspiring to see these stories of transformation of trolls. That, that for me is, is, is really, really like it. It really moves me. Um, so then, then on the machine learning side, we build tools to try and identify aspects of language and, and opens up the possibilities for what we could do. And so mostly the group uh, uh, that I'm part of, uh, which is a research collaboration between Google and Jigsaw called Conversation AI, uh, we're trying to build tools to push that boundary. And, and so I want to throw a few little bits and pieces out there, some questions and some examples to, to kind of illustrate what might be possible. So, when we think about people involved in a conversation, there are people who are viewing the conversation, reading it. They might be the recipient. Um, for them, maybe they could have more control and power over what they see. Maybe they could go, well, actually, I, I'm not in the mood today to be receiving harassment. Or maybe today, no, I really, today I want to engage with someone. I want to transform someone. Um, that's an aspect of control that we can maybe give to viewers now. For the people on the other side who are writing content, um, you know, there's, there's these three hypotheses out there, you know, of, uh, is, is abuse really the, you know, the result of a small number of trolls? There are definitely trolls, right? That's clear. But what about most, most of the language? Is, is that really the result of trolls? Or is it mostly like, you know, people who are sometimes horrible, uh, but not always horrible? Um, what about anonymity? Lots of people have hypothesized that really the problem is that it's not. I, reading the Facebook post, I mean, highlighted that, you know, this definitely doesn't affect some people. The, um, but, but maybe it affects lots of people. And on the other hand, there's another hypothesis, which is the kind of bad day hypothesis. There's a, there's a great paper by Riot Games in Nature, and we did some research on this with Wikipedia as well, that shows actually a very large amount of um, personal attacks and harassment seems to be coming from people who are regular contributors, most of the time seem to be fine, but then maybe they're having a bad day, or maybe there's a particular topic that triggers them. What is it that, that causes that? Those are things that we can start to analyze and, and help answer by building machine learning models that look at that. And then for the authors, then we can give them feedback as they're writing. Maybe we can transform the way people, people act. The, the last group, of course, is there's lots of people whose job it is to facilitate a conversation. So uh, with the, this brings us to the New York Times. The New York Times uh, m you know, manually looks at every comment before it's published in the paper. They look at comments as more like letters to the editor. This means they have a team of like 14 people full time looking at comments. And, uh, and they, turn on, they used to turn on comments on about 10% of their newspaper. Um, uh, that's a lot of work. But they are really in the goal of curating a good discussion. Can we make that easier? If we can make that easier, we maybe we could have more good discussions and do it at bigger scale. So the machine learning tools there can help the moderators to make sure they focus on the right parts. I think it's still very early days for a lot of machine learning, so mostly I advise like don't try and do auto moderation. That's like jumping ahead a little bit far. You've got all sorts of odd biases in the models, things you don't really intend to happen, and you, which will be very hard to understand the impact of if you apply it without, uh, if you apply it totally automatically. But there's a lot that can be done in terms of focusing people's attention on the right parts. Uh, so that brings us, in some sense, in my mind, to the key challenges. We've got user experience. We've got new possible user experiences that leverage machine learning, that leverage new tools, that you know, change the way we interact, whether it's groups like Civil Comments who require you know, a commenter to review three other people's comments before they post their own one, or, or whether it's our own experiments with, you know, as you're typing, you get some feedback. Um, there's a big challenge around data sets. Uh, it's really surprisingly hard to hold on to abusive comments. You know, a lot of, uh, it sounds ridiculous, right? But, but actually, tech companies like to throw away hate speech because it's a liability to hold on to it. It's a liability from a privacy standpoint, from a wipeout compliance standpoint. It's, uh, it would be really great to have legal framework that creates like collaborative large shared data sets 
that lets us actually tackle this problem. Right now, the fear of the problem itself is inhibiting us. Uh, and then the last thing is maybe on the taxonomy. We don't even really know what we're talking about when we talk about abuse. Uh, so <laughs> what is it? Is it, uh, you know, is it personal attacks? Is it threats? Is it denial of story? Is it passive aggression? Uh, and, and all of these things are interrelated, uh, but we, we need to find out what those things are. So at that, I will pass it on back to Zirak. All right, so we're just going to ask you guys to stand up and move the table a little bit more to the right. Okay, and while this is going on, could we turn off the projector somehow? Oh, yes. That's going on. And finally, we would really like to open up for questions because we really think that this discussion would be best facilitated by, or we'd have the best discussion by hearing different points of view. So if anyone has questions, let me know and I'll come running down. Hi, uh, my name is Isabel Clark. Um, this is not really a question, more of a point um, for you to ponder over. But I, sometimes I feel like the problem lies in, as you said, the classifications of what we call the all this abusive language and what society is labelling as trolling. And I mean, my issue is when, so we can put the word just in front of trolling. Oh, it's just trolling. But we can't do that in front of hate speech. It's culturally wrong to put, oh, it's just hate speech. It's, so my point is that if we can do that to trolling, like so many people nowadays are referring to hate speech as trolling. And so that's really mm -hmm. a problem that we, we need to amend. And so I don't know. I don't know if that, that's just a point. That was, it was not really a question, but thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's an important point that I think a lot of trolling researchers have tried to uh, talk about in the fact that trolling is often used somewhat sloppily as a term to describe a range of different kinds of behaviors. Um, and that there can be trolling that isn't necessarily related to uh, abusive language online. Um. Maybe I'll just add to that. There's the, in terms of taxonomies and trolling, uh, we've done some experiments with, um, with asking people, uh, you know, to say, is something aggressive? Is it a personal attack? Is it toxic? I think those kind of experiments into what the taxonomies are yeah. and what they break down into. The most recent exploration we've done is breaking down this vague, fuzzy notion of, of you know, disrespectful or toxic language, or language that's likely to make people leave a discussion into, into different subcategories. And there, of course, we also have to ask ourselves what our goal is. So from a machine learning perspective, of course, the goal is like build a great classifier for it. Uh, but then, of course, we have to try and apply that in some way that actually helps conversation. Um, so in some sense, I think we also need to define the criteria for what a good, a good answer to that question is. High enter annotator agreement covers most of the things you want, that kind of thing. And maybe Sora has something to add here, too, because satire has certain kinds of legal protections oh, and, and certain kinds of trolling, because they're cast as satire, um, get protected. Yeah, I mean, from a legal perspective, the Supreme Court has sort of said, you know, all of these exceptions around when the free speech, when First Amendment doesn't apply or when it applies, they always have this caveat, well, it's a case-by-case basis and it's always context specific, right? And we know this in terms of obscenity laws where the justices just sort of say, well, we just kind of know it when we see it, right? Um, so the law in that sense is not, I mean, the Supreme Court and that sort of lofty jurisprudence is not any help except for in marking certain broad categories that I think could be translated into some of this machine learning, you know, technology, um, so outside of, you know, sort of really outside of my language, but um, I, so I wanted, to, I, I do want to say that just because it is messy to try to distinguish between tr just trolling and hate speech doesn't mean that we shouldn't attempt it, and that the process of attempting the differentiation actually matters maybe more than the actual distinction that we would all kind of come to a consensus around. 
right? Because then you have different actors from industry, from academia, activism, um, citizens, young people sort of saying, you know what, we want um, a, a, a virtual linguistic space in which there is a shared moral sensibility that we do not allow racist and misogynistic language. And I think that a lot of this abusive language cannot actually happen without racist, misogynistic, homophobic language. It doesn't have that sort of immediate dehumanizing, stripping capacity of not simply the right to tell a story, but the capacity to tell a story. Right? So um, in that sense, the law is very helpful because it pushes us to have to make concrete what it is, what exactly that injury is, which is the reason why speaking with activists and educators, especially in the K through 12, at the K through 12 level is so important because the specific nature of the injury, I think, is it's not completely new. I mean, workplace harassment, <laughs> harassment in public spaces, that has been going on for decades. But what we see now is a, an unregulated social space where we don't really have the language to articulate what the harm is. The harm's already, by the time it's articulated, it's too late, right? We're talking at the level of when speech has become an act of physical violence. That's what the law sort of says is unprotected speech, and we know that that's not enough, right? So the psychical violence um, and articulating what that is, I think, is, is crucial. Hi. So it seems to me one, one important, or I'm trying to sort of disentangle this dimension of targeting individuals versus targeting groups, mm -hmm. right? So when you were talking earlier, or it sounded like you were setting up a contrast between abusive language and hate speech, where maybe it, it sounded like maybe you were thinking of hate speech as targeting groups and, and abusive language as targeting individuals. I'm just wondering if, if I got that right or what you all think about that sort of dimension because I don't, I think they're both extremely important things to think about and, a, and an important part of this, whatever kinds of distinctions we want to be making. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is one way to think about it. Um, and, and again, the natural language and the complexities of how you know, that is performed online um, versus this very formalistic di distinction between speech that's directed at an individual, so an individualized insult or offense, which if, is, you know, even I would say is um, protected by the First Amendment, okay, um, is different from maybe a group-based notion of um, what gets cast as an individualized offense, right? So when you, when you troll a woman and start talking about her body, about rape, about all of these things, okay? Um, th that, those kinds of signifiers are reducing her capacity to be an individual. And that I think is the sort of bias that we've seen um, certain kind of hate speech laws try to articulate, but then ultimately get struck down, right? It's our, our, our constitutional law doesn't allow those kinds of regulations, but they specifically say any kind of offense, ab um, offensive language that is motivated with the intent to injure because of someone's race, religion, gender, right? The Supreme Court has said that, that, that the first part of that statute is okay, the latter part is not. Because it's race specific, um, or gender specific, or religion specific. Um, so again, just because the Supreme Court has said that doesn't mean that we can't say, as educators, as researchers, as developers, that that is actually the definition of hate speech that we want to use and that we, don't, we will not permit 
on these platforms that we're developing. Um, it, it could just simply start with that kind of agreement. Now, I don't, in terms of policy, now that's all specific and all that, but I'm talking about general principles. So one follow-up to this question of uh, targeted to the individual versus targeted to the community uh, issue that comes up with hate speech online is a very threatening form of communication can be something that a computational system would see as neutral because it involves intimate knowledge of the person's daily routines. So people who have been uh, terrorized online often say that the most frightening communications are the ones that have to do with where they live or their daily work activities. And just a stranger establishing that intimacy with you can be one of the most frightening uh, and intrusive aspects of this kind of communication and yet very difficult for an, an NLP system to, uh, to localize. I'm, I, on that last part, it's, I think it's an open question on the difficulty for it to be identified, actually. Like, I think that there's lots of linguistic markers there, but there are definitely no data sets. Uh, so, uh, so, so we like should definitely try. Somebody <laughs> talking about your yellow kitchen, right? Like, the fact that somebody knows you have a yellow kitchen, that can, that can be something that's creepy, but it would be very hard for your system to know that yellow kitchen is a, is a, is a trigger. Hi, Jackie Wernemont, uh, Arizona State. And I wonder um, if we, if it's possible to think it, it's sort of upside down about the, the question of filters, right? I really appreciate, Liz, the observation that filters always add something, right? And if you're filtering out, um, there are certain biases, expectations, et cetera, that go to, into that. I wonder if it's at all possible to think about filtering for, mm -hmm. right? Um, thinking back to Carol's talk and the, the emphasis on, um, virtues, right? Um, and I, I think there's something actually quite powerful about a paradigm that says, let's think about the world we want, not the ways we're afraid of the world that is, or the things we should be afraid of. So are there ways that NLP could filter for, um, rather than filter out? That's a great question, which I will mostly hand to you, but I would, I would emphasize how important commenting in terms of practices of solidarity can be, particularly for people who are harassed. And um, you know, we already have things in place that allow certain kinds of comments to be amplified and ranked. Um, and that's certainly something that this community could work on. Yeah, there's also some nice work by Courtney Naples and, uh, and others on uh, you know, identifying the good comments. Uh, and that's that's a super super interesting thing. We ha then have to ask ourselves what's that taxonomy of, of good, uh, and different people want different things. So, for example, the New York Times want all of their comments to be substantial. So, if you say to the New York Times, "Awesome article," they'll reject your comment, uh, and they'll reject it because it's, it doesn't make a point, and that's that's part of their guidelines. Uh, they also like uh, personal anecdotes, uh, and then the, but this. We, I think we need to think beyond the kinds of things of what does a publication want, but also what's actually constructive for conversation. What are the, like, like you say, the statements of solidarity, or like when, when do those things really uh, help, the, the help the community, help the discussion? So as a specific example in the news context, uh, many news organizations don't allow comments on sexual assault cases, and that does inhibit certain kinds of uh, political public discussions because sexual assault is something that impacts our, our polis. Um, and so there are ways that if we can think about this question of what virtuous conversation could look like, um, that we allow certain forms of discourse to be out in the public. Hello, hi. My name is Salim. And, and like taking a step sideways, I wanted to ask, how do we foster better policy change like, we, we, we as researchers, we talk about creating classifiers, language models, but what always lags behind is actual substantive policy change. So I was, I, I was at LRAC last year, and where one of the keynote speakers was talking, her research was on online grooming and online predators, and she was talking about how, how problematic was it for her to talk to the local counselors and the people um, who, who, are, who are the lawmakers, and they were not, they were not 
easy to work with and which I feel like in the end we want our research to have some lasting policy change and I'm not sure how to go about it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that that is a, a question that's actually asked in a very grassroots sort of way about what kind of policies are already being made. I mean, I see, Carol, the way that you interacted with that one man as the, the kind of grassroots generation of a policy, right? Um, it's an individual ethic, but in, in a broad way to call it policy, um, it starts from there. Um, and I actually am very pessimistic. I mean, Donald Trump, and I realized when I said the Trump, er, you know, president earlier <laughs> that, you know, we're in an international venue, and so I, you know, I should specify Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, all of these, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of these quasi-independent commissions that are responsible for sort of overseeing um, food and drugs, telecommunications, education, employment, are all being brought to heel right now. They're all going to be functionaries of the executive branch, okay? Which means that a study like in the early 1990s that the FCC did about hate speech through, you know, at that time, not digital social media, but regular radio, television broadcasting, found relatively few incidences of hate speech, but their position after doing that research was, well, we got to put good speech in there. We got to counteract the hate speech. That's the traditional civil libertarian perspective on it, which again, I started out saying that's not, that has not been enough. That's not enough. Okay, so I asked what, was a, what would a progressive civil libertarianism approach be? But my point is that that traditional approach was guarded by these quasi-independent governing commissions. And without it, it seems like Canada has something much more robust. <laughs> Europe has something much more robust, okay. Um, but in the absence of that, what we're looking at is a sort of network or coalition amongst industry, news media, universities, citizens' organizations. That's what I think we're looking at for where the policy comes from. It's not necessarily state-focused. State Why? Because if you look to the state, then you're largely going to be asking for Criminal, criminalizing behavior. Um, so it, that's kind of how I generally see it. But again, I, 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 you know, I'm willing to be sort of persuaded in other directions. I'd love to hear from Carol. <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting when you go Canada, US, even the UK, and, and what's been happening in Australia and what's been happening there. And so I was just looking up um, the stats. And in the United States, every state in the U.S. has a bullying, has bullying legislation. 34 of them have cyberbullying legislation. So the states have already defined a difference. We need to redefine those words. I love cyber abusive language, right? That's exactly what cyberbullying language is all about. Um, now, when, when you talk about policies, unfortunately, like when, when you look at in the United States, and I have to go back there because the articles are so abundant, right? They have Jennifer's Law and Sam's Law and Chloe's Law, and it seems to be that if you have a real life tragic story and you go to your state capital, they listen to you more than if you are a researcher that has dug into interviews and statistics. Now, if you pair them up, there is your stronger case because that family um, has, has the, the background research. And then that's when you make change. But as a researcher, just, just walking up to the state capitol, it, it unfortunately doesn't work. It, it's, we seem to have it better in Canada, but it's a battle. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, it's those real life tragic stories that has put us in the round table. And I know that I only get invited because I have a, a real life story. Um, and, and 
it gets to your heart. So when you can get to those officials and, and have them feel it right there, they're more motivated to change. And so mental health, it, it's becoming more talked about. It's being okay to talk about it. And funny enough, when you go into a room full of politicians, you'll hear those real stories now. And that's why there's change. Um, okay, I'm just gonna say that we'll have the last question from uh, Mikhail because we are running out of time. Uh, I'm really sorry to all the many people who want to ask questions, but yeah, if you guys could care. Uh, Lucas or Liz, did you have more to add to the questions? I'll just add something very briefly to that, which is that there's policy at a uh, level of a country, of course, a state. There's also policy on platforms, and there's also policy in even smaller groups, in a, in a, like a subreddit or in a, in a forum. And uh, there is research, I think we can bootstrap some of this as well, right? By building machine learning models, we can do analysis to help pair with the stories, the personal stories, and say this, this phenomena that you see one of here that has had this dramatic and, and terrible consequence is this prevalent. Uh, and, and I think once you have the machine learning models to do that at scale, you can help highlight how big it is and you can, you know, close some of those stories which say, yeah, but you know, does it really happen anywhere else? Uh, and th which is an important thing to like. Uh, ground in reality. I uh, feel re really honored to have the last word here. Um, I'd like to second what uh, Lucas said in the beginning about the New York Times. Uh, I recently went to the biggest uh, German journalist conference. Uh, all the media have these problems, not only the New York Times. All newspapers, all TV stations, all radio stations, all of them have web, web pages, whatever. Uh, in all languages of the world, everywhere. It's like an order of magnitude bigger than the NLP people around. Um, and it's, it's, it's an awful lot of work we have to do, and they don't have a clue that we exist. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, a lot of languages, and it's, it's a lot of, lot of laws. I wanted to criticize you in the beginning that you were so America-centric. Yeah. Uh, it got better now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I do comparative work, and it's, 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 it's the, the United States is sort of the worst on this stuff, yeah, for sure. All right. Can, can I? Yeah. Uh, so Lucas talked about machine learning and the hopeful side of it, but I think it's also important to talk about the, the darker side of machine learning because sometimes those processes aren't as transparent to understand uh, how the algorithms are operating. Um, and I think that we also have cases, as in the Microsoft Tay case, where we have intelligent agents that are actually learning uh, to emulate uh, abusive language online from uh, discursive communities on the internet. I think uh, I'm, I think Zirak's giving me a moment to respond to that. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely, I think there's a, a lot to be said, like especially around the. I mean, the machine learning itself. You've built a model. It depends a lot on how you're going to use it. And the way you use it then becomes like a product question. And there, then your v the kind of values you define about what you do are really important. Uh, uh, we started off our work by defining the values that were going to guide our research. Because right away, as soon as you're building machine learning, especially uh, uh, in Google, you know, like, well, is it, are you going to define the kind of topics that people can talk about? Um, so, so maybe I'd just briefly leave with a, with a set of values and, and I'd love to hear your criticisms and suggestions of it. Um, so the, the kind of values that guide our research are is, is community, that like we're building tools for a community and by a community um, so that it's, it's not disconnected from them. Transparency, that the, the processes and the data and the, and the code should be open. Uh, inclusivity, we want to support a diversity of people and range of views. Uh, privacy, it should be about you know, what you say, not who you are. Uh, and it should be topic neutral. We don't want, we want to be able to discuss everything and anything uh, in the right way. Uh, so those are our initial starting points uh, and look forward to hearing more from you.